morning, Mr. Pretorius. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we are ready. Good morning, Mr. Sheikh. Are we ready? Yes, we are. Okay. Chair, just as homework, we looked at the interim constitution. There are a few more references other than the ones to which we alluded yesterday. They are not material, but we will prepare a memorandum which we can simply submit to you as a matter of law. Morning, Mr. Sheikh. Morning. Uh, you will recall that yesterday we ended at the point where you had described to the chair the contents of your meeting with the former president. Yes. <coughs> After that meeting, what did you learn about the incident involving Minister Mbalula and the information given to him, or allegedly given to him, by the Guptas regarding his imminent appointment as minister? The I've learned that the information uh, alleged in the newspapers was indeed correct, that uh, Minister Mbalula in the NEC meeting raised uh, the issue of his appointment or the notification of his appointment by the Guptas before he was appointed. So that matter was confirmed. Um. Did that confirmation come immediately after your meeting with the former president? It came. Uh, it came. It came after the meeting with the former president. It came uh, out. Yes. It came out of that meeting. No. Came. No. Came oh, after the. Oh, after. after. Yes. yes. Okay. And okay. the. I have uh, consulted with the person who gave me that information. Yes. And he, in fact, did appear before the uh, commission. Yes. And it is former Minister Spiwe Nyanda. Yes. Thank you. You so have described so I'm, to the I'm chair... So, I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. You have moved away from the meeting with the President. Yes. Uh, just well, to... um, save for one question, but in effect, yes, Chair. Oh, okay. Le well, let me wait until you have asked that one question, because it might be... The one I'm thinking of, so I'll let you. <laughs> your interaction with Minister Klele and your meeting with the President, you've alluded to the effect that those interactions had on your working relationship both with the Minister and with the President, the former President. That's correct. Just sum up. Well, uh, in, in my opinion, outcome, please. In, in my opinion, uh, it was quite clear that I lost the confidence of the president. Uh, and secondly, my relationship with uh, Minister Twele uh, was uh, set on a irrecoverable breakdown trajectory. Uh, and this was, uh, and I must say, one of the many issues in which I did not see eye to eye with uh, Minister Twele. When you say uh, there had been a loss of confidence, in your view, was the loss of confidence by the President justifiable? No, it was not. Um, were you able to tell during the meeting with the president whether in expressing the views that he expressed he in good faith did not see your point of view about the investigation or would you say he saw the, our point of view but maybe there were other reasons why he continued to take the position that he took is that something you were able to to to, 
to, to assess or is that something that you were not able to assess and you don't know whether it was a case of him genuinely believing that uh, uh, you were wrong to want to do this uh, uh, as opposed to say to, act, to knowing that you are right but not wanting it done for whatever reason. So I would, I would answer that question in two ways uh, and using two frames of reference. The first in, is my capacity as an intelligence officer. I do think the president in his capacity as a president understood what we were saying and the enormous consequences of what we were saying and it's for that reason he went into a very elaborate explanation of his relationships. If he was not concerned about what we were saying, he would have simply dismissed our concerns. So when I, it's my experience that when someone goes into elaborate explanation of relationships, it is because they are seeking to clarify that relationship and the basis of it. So that is my wearing my intelligence hat. Uh, as someone who has known the President for an incredibly long period of time, I do know that President Zuma, uh, when, I would not say he's stubborn, but when, when he does make up his mind on, on a matter, uh, it is often difficult to shift that mindset. So I think there was an element of that. But I think thirdly, uh, and I've had this experience in, in relation to my own family member and his relationship. Uh, he, I think he was being very loyal to the friendship that he was having with the Gupta family. And often that loyalty, uh, even though was causing him some embarrassment in respect of his public office, uh, the mindset in his mind uh, that he could defend that friendship and he could do so uh, justifiably uh, was made easier in his mindset by embracing, embracing the victimhood uh, state of mind. Uh, and I think he was, as a consequence, in a state of mind that says uh, he can see nothing wrong, there is nothing wrong here, uh, and that we should accept that there is nothing wrong. So the facts did not matter the, at that point. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, it's, it's quite important for, for me to try and understand various perspectives and, and also to try and understand exactly what his thinking was in regard to this issue as well as in regard to other allegations and evidence that has been given in regard to other incidents relating to the, the Guptas. Um, um, about him. Uh, Mr. Mbalula gave evidence here that on the, at the meeting of the NEC where he raised the issue that Mr. Ajay Gupta, I think it was Mr. Ajay Gupta, had called him ahead of the official announcement of his appointment as a minister, um, uh, I think, it, I can't remember whether it was of police or of sports and recreation, um, when he raised that issue at the NBC, uh, if I recall correctly, he testified it might not have been at that meeting, but he testified, if I remember correctly, that uh, whenever the issue of Mr. Zuma's friendship with the Gupta family was raised, but maybe this was Mr. Ramatroti, maybe I'm getting mixed up, <laughs> but one of them said whenever this issue was raised with, with him to say, this friendship, your friendship with the Gupta family is damaging to the organization and to government. Whoever of the two, that is Mr. Mbalula or Mr. Ramakoti, whoever gave the evidence that his response um, was often that 
something like there was nothing wrong with the friendship. The Gupta family had helped. I think him and his children when nobody could help them. So one of the questions that arises in my mind is whether if these things are true because he still will come and deal with them and give his side of the story but if they are true uh, whether this may have been a situation where it can be said that he was beholden to the family and um, uh, whatever would harm them, he would try and protect them, or whatever they wanted, uh, they would get. Maybe that's too wide, maybe most of the things that they might want, they would get. There is also the evidence which uh, he has disputed um, uh, by Mr. Temba Masego, who says he was told by the late Minister Chabane in, um, I think, late January of 2011, that he had received a call from President Zuma, who at the time was out of the country, to say he should remove Mr. Masego from the position of CEO of GCIS and um, or dismiss him or remove him. And by the time he arrived back in the country, Mr. Masego should no longer be in that position. As I, as I say, he has denied that evidence. But if that evidence were true, it may be linked to the fact that, according to Mr. Masego, a few months earlier, he had refused to cooperate with the Guptas. He had a meeting with Mr. Ajay Gupta and a telephone conversation which ended on the basis that Mr. Ajay Gupta said, according to Mr. Masego, uh, I see that you don't want to cooperate. I will report you to your seniors and they will sort you out or you will be sorted out. So it may be linked to that. Now, if it is true, and, uh, and then you have a situation where three senior officials of the intelligence come to him, they are clear that there should be an investigation uh, in, in, in involving the Guptas. And uh, he is clear that the investigation is a bad idea. And uh, the, 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 the three senior officials end up not having to proceed. And, um, and, and, and you say, as you understand the position, he appreciated the threat to national security. It's not as if he didn't appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I don't know whether, given that the, all this that I've just mentioned, you you are able to say anything about uh, what impact this friendship may have had on him in regard to making any decisions that connect that were connected with them or their businesses. Chair, I don't, <coughs> I don't have specific knowledge uh, about that relationship, and I, like, like most others, were reading the newspapers, picking up what we are picking up about what what would appear to be a inappropriate uh, uh, association, and of course, the inappropriateness of the association may not lie in the friendship itself. But uh, it was quite evident that some kind of influence peddling was taking place by, by the, the Gupta brothers, and in particular one of them that's been mentioned. Uh, and the president needed to be alive to that information peddling. And the fact that he was dismissive of it will forever remain a mystery to me, uh, and whether it was whether he was dismissive of it because he was beholden, I have no particular knowledge of that. 
but the inappropriateness of the behavior of the Gupta family, I think that is not in doubt anymore. And I must say that uh, I was present with uh, Mr. Maseko at the time that he did get that call. I recall we were having lunch together uh, and he was on his way to Sun City and he was going to Sun City when he was sitting across me when his phone rang and I could hear it was a, a difficult phone call that was taking place. So when he put the phone down, he mentioned to me, can you believe I just got a call from Ajay Gupta, who I don't know, who is telling me that he's, uh, I must take adverts out in the New Age, in newspaper, etc. And Mr. Maseko was quite rattled by that uh, phone call. Uh, and it is one of the instances that I had, even though indirect, but somewhat direct uh, experience of the kind of abuses or the kind of approaches that the Gupta family was taking with government officials. Thank you. But like I said, sir, it remains a mystery. And I think the country awaits President Zuma's explanation for what is the nature of that relationship and why why in the light of so many people raising the issue, he still felt it necessary to defend it, and if not uh, defend it, not uh, put the kind of appropriate checks and balances in place. Uh, and this, is, this goes to why the office of a president is so important to be staffed by the appropriate people to be managed in a particular way. It is to avoid you know, uh, in a sense, uh, undue influence on the office for whatever reason. And the intelligence services are there, in fact, to protect a president from such undue influences. No, thank you. So, um, and you said that uh, after the meeting, the three of you um, accepted or decided that uh, there was not going to be an investigation, is that right? That was my understanding, sir. That was uh, your understanding? That was my understanding. Uh, and certainly, as far as you know, the, the investigation did not proceed. The investigation, uh, well, there was subsequently no report yes. that was given to me yes, uh, on yes, the progress yes, of, the, yes, yes. of the investigation, so I can only yeah. but assume yeah. that the investigation did not continue. Yes. But events soon caught up with all of us in yes. respect to this matter. Yes. Uh, you said something yesterday, and I uh, just want to make sure I understand it. Um, I, I thought you expressed some kind of disappointment uh, that you found yourself in a situation where uh, you had to accept that whereas you thought an investigation was called for but none was yes. going to happen. Yeah. Yes, yes. I just want you to deal with that a little bit to make sure I understood yes. uh, the what the basis of your disappointment was. I don't I know mean, if you put it as a disappointment but uh, it it was say it is a, a, a bit of an internal reflection and I've debated often with myself. Mm and amongst our colleagues, uh, whether we should have continued mm -hmm. with the investigation, whether mm -hmm. we should have said, this is it, and draw mm -hmm. the line in the sand mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and conducted that investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it would have led to enormous troubles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it would have meant going through labor courts because mm -hmm. The moves to get us mm. removed from the intelligence services has mm. begun, mm. and I think it required a, a it required an extraordinary amount of courage and foresight mm. to be able to say, despite the fact that uh, you have lost the 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 confidence of the president mm. to continue with something, because mm. there was a constitutional court. Mm ruling on this matter. Mm -hmm. It is in the matter of Billy Masetla versus mm -hmm. the, the presidency, mm -hmm. where implied in the power to appoint mm -hmm. is the power to remove. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, it was clear that mm -hmm. the 
the power to remove us mm. did reside with the president. Mm. And if we did continue the investigation, mm. I think that removal would have been forthcoming. Mm. Uh, and of mm. course, then it meant us contesting mm. the removal on the basis of uh, constructive dismissal mm. Or, mm. Uh, mm. and find the, the mm. labor law hook mm. Uh, mm. to find, to get back to your mm. job. Mm. Uh, but it was a mountain too high to climb. Mm. Mm. But I, I often think, and that, that is why I said it reflected a, a shame, uh, partly because uh, it <coughs> was a battle that w we found uh, ourselves fighting. The, but <coughs> we come from organizations. Uh, we used to come from the ANC. We have history. They, they are people who know us. There was organizational meetings. There's uh, different cabinet ministers at the time. There was the deputy president. <laughs> there were others. But there was a, a silence. And in the light of the silence is, is an acceptance of defeat, so to speak. So I think, um, and I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone for their silence. I'm not holding them responsible for their silence. But uh, silence became uh, a feature of uh, the way governance was occurring. Um, and accepting your dismissal or accepting your removal became to be a very weird definition of dignity. Uh, but there was a silence. <clears throat> well, you refer to the judgment of the Constitutional Court in uh, the Billy Masetla matter. Um, as I recall that judgment, uh, it would not have provided you with any comfort because for the situation you were faced, you, you were contemplating. Yes. Because in that matter, although it was found that, um, I think, uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting the judgment, it was found that uh, I think Mr. Masetla had been unlawfully dismissed uh, unconstitutionally dismissed the constitutional court said he should not be reinstated yes and therefore you were very much in the same position and uh, if the president decided to remove you and you believed it, he was doing so unlawfully chances that if you went to court you could get your job back might have been very uh, diminished if 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 that or so so you you if you were aware of all of those things you all, all of that w w would have been something that uh, wouldn't have given you much courage i would imagine to 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 follow that possible approach of saying we'll pursue the investigation. If we get fired, we'll approach the courts. Yes, the, yes sir. I mean that would what, that would have been a um, a demonstration of the breakdown of trust between ourselves and the president, uh, and of course the minister, which which would have worked against us because the, the courts would have, in my view, have argued, knowing that there was a breakdown in, in, in trust, you still continued uh, with the operation for which it was preferred that you did not do, and we would have entered into the realm of insubordination. Uh, so I think we wanted to avoid that. But we did use, in fact, I did use the benefit of that constitutional judgment because the Constitutional Court, as you correctly said, ruled that the dismissal was unlawful. 
but he cannot get his job back because of the irretrievable breakdown of trust. But the relief that the court gave him was that his contract and all the perks and all the things that was due to him had to be made payable to him. And I think that was a, a, a judgment that gave me much relief because in the subsequent matters that, that occurred between the minister and I, uh, I relied on that judgment to ensure my rights. Yeah, <coughs> I, I, I think it, it could have provided the relief in terms of making sure that even if you didn't get the job back, you'd be paid um, the remuneration that you would have received if you had continued with your um, um, uh, contract. Term, your contract yeah. up to the end. The only thing, of course, is that if your focus was to get the investigation done, it would mean that you wouldn't get it done because if you are removed and you can't come back, you'll get your money, but that very investigation that you really wanted to be done then won't be done. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's unlikely anyone who gets appointed to in your place would pursue it knowing that you had been removed uh, for wanting to pursue it. So, so yeah, the judgment might have taken care of your financial situation and the family, which is an important uh, thing. But to the extent that you may have thought this, which we want to investigate, relates to national security and it's important for the nation, that would probably have come to an end. Yes. Yeah. The, and I think that, that unfortunately is the case. Uh, however, I think, and I'm just speculating again, that given the issues that are there, all law enforcement agencies, all law enforcement agencies would have to have applied their minds to the question of an investigation into the Guptas in, re in regard to any criminal matter. If I could offer some advice, sir, I would suggest that the Commission make such an inquiry of all law enforcement agencies, including the South African Revenue Services, whether in the light of speculations or issues that were publicly reported, whether they conducted any investigations, and would they avail those of investigations to the Commission? Well, it's interesting you make that suggestion because um, your evidence yesterday actually triggered that thought in my mind. Uh, <clears throat> because if the intelligence wanted to do an investigation and this is what happened, what other security uh, related agencies may have had to, may have had cause to investigate one or other thing relating to the Gupta family? Did they make decisions to investigate or did they not make the decisions to investigate even though there were grounds to do so? And if they did make the decision to investigate, where did those investigations end? And um, did they get the support that they were supposed to get from whoever? Were there any people who uh, interfered with those investigations? So I think your suggestion is, is, a, is, a, is a good one. It's important to have a, 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 a view as part of trying to see to what extent various you know, security agencies may have had opportunities of doing something and maybe either didn't do anything but themselves or tried but were not pre were prevented or were not assisted to, to continue. Or persuaded otherwise. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mr. P Mr. Pretorius. Thank you. Arising out of uh, your evidence this morning, uh, Mr. Sheikh, you've 
dealt with the meeting between you and the president and tried to understand from a subjective point of view his motivations, reasoning, good faith stance and the like. Uh, I'd like to put it to you from a different perspective, please. At that meeting, the president was being approached in his capacity as head of intelligence. As the head of the executive responsible for intelligence. Intelligence, yes. yes. We've used the term yes. loosely, I understand. Um, and you've referred to his constitutional responsibilities in relation to the control and direction of services in 2092 of the Constitution. Correct. At that meeting, the issue of his relationship with the Gupta family arose. That's correct. And he sought to explain, at the very least, let, or even defend his relationship with the Gupta family. That's correct. Now, Clearly, and you've used the word, there's a conflict. Yes. Objectively speaking, your opinion, and uh, it's an opinion, and uh, the chair will be aware of that, obviously, but he is interested in opinions. Given your knowledge and experience of the constitutional responsibility of the president in his capacity as the executive person accountable for intelligence, was this a justifiable approach? In my opinion, sir, it, it was not a justifiable approach. The president, uh, in his capacity as president, uh, could not separate his personal relationship from his responsibility as a head of state, in particular to the advice that was given by his chiefs of intelligence. Uh, and I think in, in that sense, he was not uh, fully cognizant of his responsibility and the constitutional responsibility that he had in the direction of the intelligence services in either what the intelligence services do or do not do. Let's move to paragraph 29 of your statement, if we may. Uh, is that moving away from the meeting? Yes. Okay, just one last question, maybe two. In terms of what the president said to you at that meeting after you and your colleagues outlined uh, why you believe that it was necessary to conduct an investigation, you did say that he gave a long history of the Gupta uh, family uh, and maybe his relationship with them as well, but he went to town explaining various things. My question is this, in whatever he said, was he addressing the pertinent issues or the pertinent grounds which made you or the three of you believe that there should be an investigation? Uh, no, he was not. The, he was not, uh, in, in everything he was saying, uh, yes, it would have explained the close personal relationship that he had, which may be justifiable, which may be understandable, but he was not applying his mind to the national security issue that information was peddled, uh, which implicates uh, his office uh, and therefore needed to be investigated objectively. And I think the one, the one issue that I must raise is that the difficulty the three of us had in speaking to, to, to uh, former President Zuma about the matter is that in many ways he was once upon a time our head of ANC intelligence and the relationship uh, was making the assumption and we were making the assumption that the, the fact that we were raising it in the way we were raising it that the president would rely on his previous knowledge about intelligence and know that this is a serious matter that needs to be looked at. Uh, irrespective of his personal relationships, an approach could have been designed to have managed that uh, and ensured that, you know, 
the personal relationship is, is taken into consideration in the finding of, of the investigation itself. Uh, so I just got the sense that his state of mind had evolved to a point where he could not make that separation. I think you, you, you understood my question correctly, but I'm going to say this just to make sure um, it's clear. You could have a situation where you get evidence that so-and-so was um, has committed the crime of theft at such and such a location, blah, 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 and you have information that he was seen in that vicinity, maybe carrying something that looked like what has been stolen. So you say, I want to investigate this. But somebody who is a friend to that person might say to you, no, 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 you are wasting your time. Mm. Uh, that man is a good man. Mm. And he might start telling you about, let's say, his drug credentials and so on and so on and so on. But not answering the question whether there isn't a need to investigate because there is information that he was seen in the vicinity of where something was stolen and carrying something that looked like what was stolen. So, so that's what I'm looking. I'm looking at whether, sure. it, within the context of that example, he was dealing with the facts mm. that give rise to the to the conclusion we should have an investigation, yeah. or whether it was a question of saying, "No, so and so is a very good person. Mm. Look what he has done for the community. You know, maybe the Guta family are employing mm. a lot of South Africans and what, 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 but not going to the issues." Sure. <coughs> So, and, and, and I think we should also be mindful that uh, at that point in time, the President Zuma himself has come through a decade or possibly more than a decade of investigations in the unfortunate way this has happened. So investigations into his friends Uh, I'm sorry, I just have to <coughs> take okay. a moment to okay. smile on this. But <laughs> investigations into his friends, yes. one of them having been Shabir Sheikh, uh, yes. led, led to, to prosecution and yes. successful prosecution as well. Yes. Yes. So I could understand sitting yes. outside of this, yes. uh, his state of mind yes. when he is, his friends are mm. getting investigated, yes. it's so easy in his state of mind to move from, is this another attempt to come towards prosecuting me, etc. Mm -hmm. But that would be mm -hmm. a very, a, me trying to be incredibly, to understand the state of mind. Yeah, to put yourself in your, his position. Correct, to put yes. him in his correct. Yes. But okay. notwithstanding that, and that is why I'm saying that there came a point in his administration where he could not separate even in his state of mind, the personal relationship with the Guptas from his responsibility as the head of the national executive with certain constitutional obligations and requirements. All things started to be seen through the same prison and created enormous complications. Well, I think it's, 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 it's good you make the point that maybe if one puts oneself in his shoes, um, uh, it's to be expected that somebody in that position would think about the past, what has happened to uh, one of his friends, and the fact that uh, uh, although charges against him had been withdrawn, there, 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 there were still attempts in the courts to make sure that decision is reversed. I would imagine that it's legitimate to think maybe all of those could be things that he could think and could have thought about. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. The yes. Well, I, I've had evidence from Mr. Masana who was NTPP at a certain stage, uh, talking about how he, or his departure from the office of NTPP, 
one of the things he said was that uh, he had been told that some people had told President Zuma that he was contemplating restating the charges against him that had been withdrawn. And one of the things that the Commission is looking at is um, why was he removed? Um, because the settlement agreement made it clear, as I recall, that he was fine for, for the job. And there are all kinds of things. So I just mention these things because one has got to try and have a, 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 a globular picture. Thank you. Ms. Torres, you may proceed. Well, um, from legal team's point of view, I'd like to come back to a particular point in relation yes. to this uh, exchange. Uh, you've had a discussion about the President's personal apprehensions, his friendships, his history, uh, what he feared might happen to him in relation to um, his own impending prosecution. Um, or perhaps it wasn't impending at that time. But those go to motivation and understanding his state of mind. <clears throat> if we may return to an objective assessment of the position, whilst there may be explanations for why the former president acted in that meeting and subsequent thereto in the way that he did, objectively speaking, did he carry out his duties as head, executive head, accountable constitutionally for intelligence? Regrettably not. <clears throat> After that meeting, um, did you continue working for the State Security Agency? Uh, I did. Uh, I did for a few more months. And during the remaining period of your employment at SSA, what happened to the developing or the not developing relationship? Well, the, my relationship in particular with Minister Trele broke down completely. Uh, he took to micromanaging the, the, the organization, the, the foreign branch, uh, and he would have people in the organization report directly to him. If he wanted things to be done, he would do it by them. Uh, I was required to just sign off on, on matters. Uh, it put everyone in a very difficult position. It put, uh, well, there were some individuals who gloated in this, uh, but there were others, very capable people, who felt uh, that they were put in a very compromising position because they respected me as the, the head of their service but yet they were receiving instructions from the minister's office to do certain things uh, which required my signature uh, and just my signature, not, not an explanation, not uh, a report to, etc. And this became a untenable situation for me and, uh, and, and there were on, on different occasions uh, the, the minister took to, and it's a it's a, a, a particular feature that I've since discovered some in my other job, took to me having to write explanations on almost everything. Uh, I needed to write explanations in relation to a, a friendship I had, a person had died. Uh, I had to explain that friendship. I had to explain, uh, you know, different things I did. And he wanted this in writing. Uh, and I would, I would duly oblige my, uh, him and, and give such things in writing. But I think we were both uh, coming to a understanding that the relationship, uh, something needs to happen because uh, the relationship is, is uh, not working. I appealed uh, to 
to, and I don't know whether it was in this period or before, I appealed to President Zuma uh, to intervene in this, in this matter. Uh, but at some point, I, I received a phone call to meet with the, the minister. Was and this around June 2011? Yes. And in fact, and, uh, and he asked, he expressed his unhappiness uh, and asked whether I would consider a resignation from, from the department and get transferred to another department. Uh, I said uh, I would give serious consideration to this. I would think about it and, and come back to him on, on the matter. Uh, However, before, and I really did think of resigning, I thought that was the most elegant way uh, out of the situation. I must say, by then, and, and this, uh, by then I was, I was thinking that the relationship is just, you know, just not worth the energy anymore. The job is not worth the energy. It's a great, passionate, wonderful, futuristic job. Uh, but in the hands of this minister, it's only going to lead to frustration for me. But before I could tender my resignation, he called me to a meeting. And I went to the meeting, and I'm th I, I was really thinking that at this meeting, uh, I would be served my notice of termination. But uh, to my surprise, he made a offer to me that was not for him to make. But nevertheless, he made the offer. And that offer was that uh, he was going to appoint me as the South African ambassador to Japan. Uh, Pause there for a moment. Your knowledge of where the power lay in relation to appointments of min uh, ambassadors, what was it? Yes. Uh, at that point, and again, I don't want to be disrespectful to, to Minister Maete, but at that point, uh, I did get the sense that Minister Koele was acting as the shadow foreign minister. But even if he was acting as a shadow foreign minister, he had no power, no constitutional authority to make the offer, nor did he have the authority to make such appointment. The appointment of ambassadors is a constitutional responsibility of the president. And the fact that he could make this offer to me was engaging me in a discussion of which I consider to be unconstitutional. Uh, and I didn't want to be part of that discussion with him. Uh, and and I, I informed him accordingly that uh, ambassadorships is not for ministers to, to appoint. And please do not discuss this matter with me. If he wants, he could ask the president to discuss it with me, who has the authority to appoint ambassadors. Are you certain that he put it to you in terms of him appointing you, or could it be that he offered to make a recommendation to the president uh, that you be appointed ambassador of Japan. So I've, I've in that meeting, and I remember it very well, because it was a very uh, a meeting that was uh, like all my subsequent meeting with Minister Toile, very tense. Uh, he said, "I." want to appoint you as ambassador. And I think the use of the word I really sparked a, a flare in my, in my limbic brain. Uh, and I really got angry uh, because I could not accept the, the level of unconstitutionality that Minister Kwele was now going through. Uh, he did not say, I will recommend. Uh, in fact, I said to him that he doesn't have this authority to appoint uh, people as ambassadors. And then he said, but you know, this is the way we speak in the ANC. Uh, 
and I had to remind him even on the matters of the ANC, I may have a little bit more knowledge than he has. But I did not want to push that matter further because I was not there in my capacity as an ANC member. I was there as the head of the South African Secret Service. Uh, and I then, then thanked him for his offer but said it is not for him to offer and if the president wants to to appoint me as an ambassador, the president is free to have that discussion with me. And I think I, I did say to him categorically that him and I both need to now agree that the relationship is irreversibly broken down between us and that I would uh, want to discuss this matter now with the president. Uh, and I sought his permission to, to go and see the president uh, to discuss my exit from all my exit from the department. You mentioned in you mentioned in your may I, chair? you mentioned in your statement uh, that your reaction to the offer, for want of a better word, for the moment, um, wasn't an attractive one in any event. Uh, the offer to go to Japan. Yes, because at, at, at that time, uh, unfortunately, there was uh, the nuclear, there was an earthquake in Japan and the, the, there was a nuclear meltdown in terms of the, the reactors. And there was a bit of panic, even though that was a bit far from Tokyo. There was a bit of panic about what is the consequences. But the, so Japan didn't appeared to me at that time to be a attractive offer. I knew its importance. It's uh, as a country in the G7, the, the relationships with Africa, the relationship with South Africa. So I knew it was an important posting, uh, but it was not a, a, an attractive one for me at that time. And then you said something about Minister Kuala being Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs. Tell me more about it. What does that mean? Well, during my time as head of the Secret Service, and you would understand, sir, that we are almost very parallel to, to uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs, or it's now called the Department of International Relations and yes. Cooperation. But I did find the propensity of Minister Trele traveling abroad uh, to various countries, often in, in, in the company of the President and often in the company of uh, the Minister of uh, International Relationships, International Relations, uh, I found that to be odd. Uh, odd in the sense that that is not the task of a Minister of Intelligence. Uh, and again, it, it was raising this concern in my own mind about what does a Minister of Intelligence do uh, and because at the time he was acting as a special envoy, as time he was uh, involved in multilateral issues, etc. Uh, I'm not, so I'm not saying that uh, uh, he does, should not have done that. I'm just saying that the level and the amount of trips that were, were been conducted and the engagements, it came across to me as a shadow uh, uh, foreign affairs minister. And yes. it may be so. Uh, it's not, mm. it's not, not a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not putting it like that. I'm just saying yes. it may be so. Yes. No, no, that, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm just thinking that uh, the notion of a shadow minister is, with your is it not is it not always attached to the opposition party? <laughs> 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 okay, all right, Mr. Pretorius. Did you subsequently meet with the president, former president? I I did. I I met with former president Zuma. Uh, briefly, what occurred at that meeting? And uh, I put I put to Mr. Uh, I put to the president, and I and I and I and I and I must say that I put it in a way that didn't open a discussion. Uh, I put to the president that my relationship with Minister Kwele is is 
done and dusted. Uh, I'm not willing to go back. Uh, and the question, and I then said to him in a jovial kind of way that, you know, and of all things, he posted me, he wants to post me to Japan, you know. The, so the president laughed at that, and I said to the president, you know, the, he now wants to take your job, uh, you know. <laughs> so we had a, a light uh, exchange about the matter, and then said to the president that uh, if there was another offer, uh, if there was New York or Canada, uh, you know, I would give serious consideration to it. Why Canada? Uh, Canada because my wonderful, beautiful soulmate, my wife, is Canadian uh, and I thought that she has spent an enormous amount of time in South Africa and through all my trials and tribulations. So the one good thing I could do for her uh, is to take her and the kids uh, to Canada where at least the children could spend much more time with the grandparents. So Canada was attractive in, 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 in that regard. So you, you came up with that idea? I came up with that yes. idea, yes. Okay. And what was the president's reaction to that part? The president smiled and in his very jovial way says, leave it to me, my brother, I'll see what I can do, uh, I'll come back to you. Okay. Well, what happened then? Let's continue this storyline. So about three hours later, I remember I was uh, just about to go to bed and uh, I got a phone call from the Director General of Durko, uh, Ambassador Jerry uh, Machila, who is now the ambassador in uh, United Nations. Uh, just for um, record purposes, Durko being? Oh, Durko being the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. And uh, the DG said to me, uh, and we still refer to each other as ambassadors, so it was very polite, he says, Ambassador Sheikh, uh, like to inform you that we have, we will be moving the ambassador from Canada to Japan. The Canadian post is now available. Uh, would you give us your acceptance of the post? I uh, I put the phone down and and I was in a state of shock. Uh, and then I'll tell you why, because it is now, this is the first direct indication to me that it is President Zuma who really wants me to leave the intelligence services. I had that discussion with no one else but President Zuma uh, about either New York or, or Canada and within hours of that phone call, things were put in place for, for my leaving. Uh, so I said I would uh, come back to him. Um, the, my wife was very excited about it. Uh, so we had a family discussion. Uh, with, the, with my wife's uh, parents so we could discuss whether we should take this offer up or not and after due consideration uh, after due consideration uh, I declined uh, when the DG, Mr. Jerry Machila, I spoke to you. Did he make any reference to the president? Uh, you have made the point that the president was the only person to whom you had expressed this preference, um, that if the offer was in relation to New York or, or, or Canada, you could consider it. And it seems that um, he, the, the way what he said to you seemed to be based 
on somebody telling him of part of your discussion with the president, whether it was the president or somebody else who got information from the president, we don't know. But did he, in his conversation, to say, uh, I've been asked by the president um, uh, to ap approach you following the discussion you have had with him or anything like that? No, he did not. Uh, uh, Director General uh, DG, uh, DG uh, Machila at the time, did not make reference to any discussion with the president or in fact the minister. Uh, but he did say to me, he said, Mo, uh, man, you've got a lot of pull, you know, so. You have a lot of pull, you know, mm -hmm. the, so I, we joked about that, but, mm -hmm. uh, but no, uh, he didn't mention. But the, what he said to you, uh, if you didn't think it was linked to the discussion you had with the president, would have been coming out of the blue. Yes, it would yeah. have, yeah. But yeah. I knew I had that, it, so it was, you know, I was uh, taken aback by the, the fact that this happened so soon. Mm. Uh, I would have uh, expected a, the president to call me to say, listen, I've given yes. consideration, etc. Yes. Uh, but it was now put mm. in motion, so mm. to speak. Mm. But you say after due consideration, yes. you declined. Yeah. And the, the consideration was very simple that at, at that time, at the time it was an age thing. Uh, I think I must have been 52 or 53. Uh, and if I took the posting, I would have returned uh, at the age of about 57. At the age of 57, to start a new career, uh, would be quite challenging. I'm not saying it's possible. So I then, we evaluated it as a family from yes, and we appreciated the, the, the benefit of would have been in Canada, but uh, I for one uh, wanted to move out of government now, or wanted to move out of the situation of insufferable ministers uh, and to be to be put back in a position where you now, as an ambassador, will have to report to a minister. And I did not have a good relationship with Minister uh, Mashibane. Uh, and I didn't want to be in a situation where I would just be, you know, having to accept uh, whatever is coming to me uh, and not having options. So I evaluated it together with my wife and she was very gracious in accepting that okay the we turned down the 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 offer uh, and we will start a new life thank you and I understand um, it's not controversial I can lead you on it I presume that you resigned in February 2012 Yes, I, I did resign in February 2020, uh, thing. but let me, let me just say on, on the resignation, because it was a negotiated matter, I felt the moment we took the decision to, to uh, not accept the posting to Canada, uh, I had to inform uh, President Zuma that I am declining the offer. I didn't, I didn't want to go through the back channels and so I did have a meeting with President Zuma and uh, told him that I thanked him very much for the offer but I will not be taking it up uh, and I gave him the reason that uh, you know I want to go back into the private sector and build a career in the private sector as luck would have it and as the universe would have it uh, a opportunity arose where I could play a role in, in uh, the development bank. Uh, a new bank was being established and I was asked to, to consider playing a role in, in that bank. But the, one of the requirements was that I would have to upgrade my skills in management, etc. And uh, it was suggested to me that I uh, consider 
various institutions where I would be able to spend a, a short period uh, and after consultation uh, with Nick Benedel from Gordon Institute of Business, uh, it was decided that he recommended that I should go to Harvard uh, for the advanced management program. Uh, which, but that was a very expensive uh, affair. And it then turned on the issue of how the length of the contract uh, between that we signed uh, when we first joined in 2009. By that time, Cabinet has taken a decision that all Director Generals serve for a period of five years rather than a period of two or three years. And in light of the constitutional ruling, uh, I then approached President Zuma to say, my understanding is that this contract is for five years rather than three years, which is what Minister Twele was insisting upon. President Zuma was gracious, he agreed. It is a, a five-year contract. And then this allowed me to negotiate with uh, Minister Twele uh, a settlement agreement in which I settled on a particular amount between three and the five year, but that would allow monies to be paid to Harvard uh, for my, my studies there. I harbored under the illusion that if I applied as an individual to, to Harvard Business School that I may not get accepted. Uh, subsequently, I found uh, that you could do that. Uh, so this is why the SSA paid, and it was incorrectly reported in the newspapers that it was stated it was monies due to me, which were administered by the SSA uh, in respect of payment to Harvard the Business School, which I did. And on return from Harvard, I applied for a a job in the development bank of uh, Southern Africa and I was successful in getting that job. Before we go um, on in time, uh, <coughs> Mr. Sheikh, to complete the picture there will be direct evidence shortly um, in relation to Mr. Njenje. Uh, did any similar offer emanate from the authorities in regard to an ambassador post for him? Yes. Uh, around about the same time, a, and I remember the, quite clearly that uh, 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 Director Chenje was made a similar offer to a post in Africa as uh, ambassador to, to the post. And uh, Chenje, and, and, and I must say this because Often it is considered that the three of us are in dynamic consultation with each other. A remarkable feature um, of the relationship between the three of us is how little we consult on decisions that we arrive at, but yet we all seem to arrive at the same decisions. Uh, none of them have ever told me to, to accept or not accept the, the position and neither did I ever mention to, to or discuss with uh, Mr. Jenji that he should not accept the post. He arrived at his de decision independent of me as independent of our DG Makatuk as well. Yes, he refused the post. He refused the post. Before moving on, there's just one matter I need to deal with, but this may eat into the short adjournment time. Um, uh, maybe you are reacting to the fact that I was looking like I wanted to say something. <laughs> and you thought maybe I'm about to say, is it not tea time? <laughs> uh, no. Um, I think I, 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 I wanted to ask something in relation to that last point. As far as you know, um, or let me put it this way, your departure from 
uh, intelligence in 2012. Uh, was it a consequence of your conclusion that you had lost um, or that your relationship with Mr. Minister Kwele had irretrievably broken down and that you had lost the confidence of the president or was it just the fact that uh, your relationship with Minister Kwele had irretrievably broken down? I think it was both, sir. It was uh, both. It was both. Uh, and I understand it. It's yes. the nature of life in, in the intelligence world. Yes. But yes. it was both. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you. Is this a convenient time? Yes, let's take the tea adjournment. Uh, we will resume at half past 11. We adjourn. All rise.
Okay, let's proceed. Thank you, Chair. You've described this morning, Mr. Sheikh, how your services came to an end. I hesitate to put a legal label uh, on how the law would regard the termination of your services. It's not for the purpose of your evidence now. Uh, I don't know whether you should pull the mic closer to you or you should raise your voice, but... Uh, My apologies, Chair. Yeah, okay. I hesitate to put a legal label on the termination of your services, but I do wish to ask you, in your own mind, what was the cause of your dismissal or your resignation, whatever label one wants to put on it? The, 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 I think the correct label to put to my departure from <coughs> the intelligence services was an irretrievable breakdown between Minister Kwele and myself, uh, the origins of which lies in me being part of a decision to investigate the Guptas. Uh, and for that, I have no doubt. The, and of course, the exit was an elegant exit in terms of a negotiated settlement uh, in respect of my rights in, in the contract and my insistence that the contract was for five years and not for three years. And it is correct, is it not, that the three senior executives uh, in, in the intelligence service at the time uh, ended their employment around the same time? That's correct, sir. Um, going back to your own departure from intelligence in 2012, you say that the cause was the irretrievable breakdown of the, your relationship with Minister Kweli, and you say the origins of which were related to your having been part of the decision to investigate the Guptas. That's correct. Is that right? Are you able to say what else um, the two of you could not agree upon that characterized this breakdown or that contributed to this breakdown um, or, or is it really that uh, difference of opinion on the, on the investigation of the Guptas and whatever else came, uh, happened after that really was attached to that? I think the, the investigation on the Guptas was a significant matter. It was a, 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 a huge turning point in the relationship. Um, because up until that point, there was still a possibility of appeal to the president uh, that Minister Kwele is, is not totally understanding of the, his portfolio. And, uh, but after the, 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 the Gupta issue, so to speak, the, clearly uh, it is Minister Kwele who had the confidence of the President and we, and as consequence me, did not have the confidence of the President. So that was a significant turning point, but there were other issues as well. Uh, and I would give uh, a few of those. One is, there was an election in regard to uh, Cote d'Ivoire in which uh, the election was contested between Bagbo, the incumbent president at the time, and Ouattara, uh, who was the president coming from the north. Could uh, you spell those names for the record, please? Can you? I know, I know Bagbo is quite difficult. Bagbo is difficult given the language there, and I think Ouattara is uh, Q U A T T A R A. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the first round of the elections. I think uh, Babo was, I think, starts with a G. It starts and with a G. G B A G B O. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So the yeah. first, uh, was that a test? <laughs> the, so the first, uh, pause. The, the first round of the elections, Bagbo uh, lost, uh, won the first round, and Watara lost, and it was a quite a close margin. And then uh, the second round of the elections were held in which Watara won. The information I received in my capacity as head of the Secret Service was that notwithstanding um, the issues around the free and fairness of the election, that the, the results generally is that Watara won the election. The UN uh, came out in support of uh, Watara ECOWAS, which is the, the uh, West African the regional, regional. Mm -hmm. regional body, came out in support of Watara. And the question is, what was South Africa's position going to be? Uh, the minister was of the view, together with, with others, that uh, Bagbo uh, won the election and not Watara. And I was of the view that, together with others, that irrespective of who won the election, that the fact that the United Nations has expressed a view on it, it is in our multilateral interest to go with the outcome of the, uh, uh, the, the Watara election. So that was one of the major, uh, one of the disagreements. The other concerns the, the appointment or the lobby for Nkosazana Zlamini Zuma to assume the chair of the African Union. I, and again with others, were of the view that uh, it may not be in South Africa's medium to long-term interest for us to, to lobby for that position, given the kind of uh, uh, protocol that exists that we do consider ourselves as a significant power on the continent, and it's not necessary for us to go for the position. Uh, it'll cause a, a, a kind of divide along francophony and other lines. And I was of the view that we should avoid that conflict. The minister and others were of the view that we should lobby for that position and that we should uh, go for that position. So that was another example where we disagreed on policy issues. Uh, and there are a few others like that uh, where we had significant disagreements. And of course, uh, it just became clear to me that my views or my uh, actions were, were increasingly brought under the microscope. There is one issue that broke the camel's back. Uh, it's an allegation that the minister made in respect of my own loyalty to, to the country. Um, he was spreading a, a rumor uh, or disinformation about that I work for another government, uh, Secret Services, uh, which is not true. I am, uh, and the reason why I'm being a bit vague about it, sir, and I'm going to take the, the punt. Uh, I have written a book where most of this is, is, is there. Um, but for the purposes of this commission, I would say that, yes, he, he also brought my loyalty to the country uh, in question. Uh, but I took comfort from the fact that the people close to me, uh, and in particular my two colleagues, were dismissive of, of that allegation, and nothing, nothing came of it. <clears throat> the reason why I asked that question was just to see whether uh, this was simply a situation where Maybe it could be argued that you were pushing for something to be done or things to be done that uh, were lawful and that maybe his approach was different in regard to that or whether it's a situation where 
maybe some things might fit into one person pushing for something that's lawful, another one pushing for a different thing, uh, and other things which have got nothing to do with what's legal, what's not legal, but simply operational issues and policy issues that might have divided the two of you. Sure. So, but from what you are saying, it looks like that there were, there may have been a number of issues relating to policy where you, the two of you, might not have agreed, mm -hmm. or maybe some operational issues as well. Is that correct? The, that is that is correct. Uh, on the policy issues, uh, policy um, dissonance or policy contestation is a incredibly good thing in policy formulation. So having different perspectives, uh, but of course, given the the very unique position of intelligence, your policy posture must take into account all considerations, and you've got to not only seek the short-term benefit, you've got to see the medium and long-term consequences. Uh, and I, I was increasingly getting a sense that Minister Kwele and then, and then later on uh, President Zuma was applying short-termism uh, and taking short-term benefits without due consideration to the medium and long-term consequences of those benefits because there is no free lunch. Uh, as, as, as we have discovered from Saxon World. Uh, but the important thing is in intelligence, you welcome disagreement, you welcome contestation, you welcome uh, different perspectives because you are enriched by that process. And this is why I say that Minister Kwele, uh, lack of experience in the intelligence world started to show and started to have a effect because of the role he was playing so close to the president, so close to the foreign ministry, it started to have an effect on the choices uh, we were making uh, in the national interest. And, and, and of course, that didn't sit very well with me. Would you categorize your departure from intelligence in 2012? Uh, in the terms of you having been pushed out or in the terms of you having decided to withdraw in the light of the situation that you have described? I was uh, pushed out. You were pushed out. I was pushed out. Uh, but they, there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful uh, saying the, I think Minister, Minister Toile thought he could bury me. He just didn't understand that I'm a seed, I grow. Uh, I don't, you know, so I, I grew and I grew out of that situation. I found an elegant exit. Uh, and yeah, the, I'm better off in the position that I am today than I was then. Okay, thank you. Mr. Petrus. Of course, the manner in which you testified you were treated, particularly by Minister Tkwele, um, may have been a result of the breakdown rather than the cause of it. Do you have any comment on that possibility? Yes, uh, again, I would go back. If I look at all the possible significant causes, I would have to conclude that the being party to the decision to investigate the Guptas was the significant cause. Uh, everything that resulted from that moment was uh, as a consequence of that uh, because I think the trust levels were invariably broken around that level. At the time uh, of you leaving the service, intelligence service, uh, did you have any communication with any of the Gupta brothers? Yes. Uh, I did have a, a communication. When the, I think it was just the media, um, and I think it was the Mail and Guardian, uh, was going to write a story that the 
Guptas were behind my firing or our firing from the intelligence services. Uh, I received a phone call from Mr. Ajay Gupta. He identified himself as Mr. Ajay Gupta and said to me that the Mail and Guardian is going to be writing a story about uh, uh, that he or they were behind my firing and that he would like me and of course he then said uh, and my brother you know we are family mm -hmm. so I had to correct Mr. Gupta and say I'm sorry we are not family uh, he then said yes but you know what I mean I had to correct him again says, no, I really don't know what you mean uh, and then he said well you know I should tell the media that this is not true uh, and I said Mr. Gupta the difficulty I have with that is that I don't know whether it is not true uh, and I don't know whether it is true uh, so all I am prepared to say to the media and which is what I did say was no comment that I have no comment to make on the matter and that was it but he attempted to get me to agree or get me to say that uh, uh, he was not behind my firing of course what he did not know at the time is that he had on various occasions to at least one person uh, that I know alluded to the fact that uh, you know they'd really wanted to get me out of the intelligence services. He had, he had mentioned uh, to a, uh, a person in the intelligence services that mm -hmm. I am part of a group of people who is planning to uh, remove Zuma mm -hmm. and they've got to remove me from the services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course at the time I didn't pay much attention to it. I was dismissive of it because mm -hmm. I didn't believe and I must, I must be quite honest, I didn't, I didn't really believe at that time that the Guptas had that much influence mm -hmm. on state of affairs. Uh, mm -hmm. I always considered them mm -hmm. uh, to be quite mm -hmm. open about it. Uh, mm -hmm. I considered them to be hangers-on mm -hmm. that you normally get in, you know, in the political processes, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I did not know of the enormous influence that they wielded. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether the person to whom that was said may be prepared to testify? I will consult accordingly. You will consult. Yes, please, thank you. And then be in touch with the legal team of the commission. Will do. Thank you. After your return from Harvard, I understand that you were appointed as the group executive of the International Unit of the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Is that correct? That's correct. And you occupied that post from August 2012 until your early retirement in August 2017. That's correct. In March 2016, were you aware of a memorandum that was submitted to the Secretary General of the ANC, Mr. Gwede Montash, addressed to him and the ANC by senior commanders and commissars of the former military wing of the ANC in Contra Yes, Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. What was your involvement in relation to that memorandum? The I was asked by uh, General Spiwa Nyanda to, to draft that uh, memorandum uh, and he provided the input and my task was to draft it up and, and send it to him for approval, which, which I did. Uh, right. Uh, Chair, that memorandum has been dealt with in evidence at some length. Um, 
I'm not sure that it's necessary unless you wish to go into any more detail in that regard. No, I don't think there is any is necessary unless the witness has anything he wants to highlight uh, in it. But otherwise, we have I've had evidence on it. No, no. I, I presume, as the drafter or one of the drafters of the memorandum, uh, you stand by its contents. Yes, I do. The memorandum made reference, amongst other things, to the removal of Minister Nene from his post of Finance Minister in December 2015 and his proposed redeployment to the BRICS New Development Bank. That's correct. What do you know from your involvement in the banking sector of the so-called offer that was made to Minister Nene of a position in the BRICS Bank? Yes. Chair, just as a, a way of background, in my capacity as a group executive of the Development Bank of Southern Africa, I had uh, reason to be made aware of the discussions in regard to the formation of the new development bank. Uh, it has a long history and the DBSA had played an instrumental role in all of the discussions and the construction and the debates about the bank itself, the new development bank. So the new development bank has shareholders uh, which sits at the level of the uh, presidents of the country and they, they are the shareholders of effect of the bank. Then it is, its next governing body is the, the board of governors and in the board of governors is where the ministers of uh, finance sit. And below that then is the president of the bank and his management team. So I wanted just to explain those three levels of governance to see where this is leading to. So Minister... I, I'm sorry, I must just make sure I understand. I sometimes get confused uh, between what I believe is a bank that we have in South Africa that has got development as well, and then the, what I refer to as the BRICS Bank. Yes. Uh, are we talking about the BRICS Bank now? We're talking about the same bank. Uh, oh, it's the called same. the New Development Bank, or otherwise known as the BRICS Bank. Okay, all right. Okay. So, but just to keep it on the same language, we'll refer it to as the BRICS Bank. So, the BRICS Bank has the shareholders at the first level. The second level is the Board of Governors, which is constituted by the ministers of finance of the four uh, or the five countries. Below that then is the president of the bank itself, who is effectively the CEO of the bank and with his or her management team. So this is how the bank was envisaged. Its headquarters was going to be in Shanghai, China. And during this negotiations about the BRIC bank, the question of a regional office, a regional office of the BRICS Bank to be established in Africa as a starting point. And it took a lot of lobbying and eventually it was agreed that the regional bank will be set up in South Africa. Now the regional bank is precisely that. It is a regional bank. It's a branch of the new development bank or of the BRICS Bank. And the decision of who would be the person who heads that regional bank is a decision of the management of the bank itself. Not even the governors. It will, of course, all, all decisions of importance will go to the governors for ratification. But the interviews, the choice, etc., will be done by the management of the new development bank or the BRICS bank. And it is not a separate bank. It's not a separate bank. It's not a, a separate entity from the New Development Bank. It is a office of the regional bank. And as such, the, the position was uh, advertised and people, there's a process that uh, the, the management uh, of the New Development Bank 
appointed a headhunting team, they headhunted and people had to apply, etc., etc. The, there is no way a shareholder could impose on the management of the bank a nominee for regional officer without violating the corporate governance issues of the bank itself. Uh, the, it's just not done and it is uh, not good in terms of banking and it is not good in terms of the governance issues and that will affect it would have affected the rating of the bank itself if shareholders are making decisions about who the employees of the bank is. So to be quite clear, the regional branch of the New Development Bank is an employee of the New Development Bank. The memorandum to which we've just referred, uh, the memorandum um, of March 2016 also made reference to the conduct of the Hawks in the investigation of the so-called rogue unit and SARS. Now again we don't need to go into that category of issue but it does raise an issue with which the Commission may be concerned at the end of the day to assess and that is the use of intelligence services or quasi-intelligent services and disinformation. Do you have any comments on that? You've mentioned it briefly before, but yes. if you have anything to add, please do. Before you do so, please don't forget the question. Don't forget this question. Yes, but before you deal with it, I want to go back to the question of Mr. Nene and the post that he was said to be deployed to in the Briggs Bank, because that's what you were talking about yes. a few minutes ago, isn't it? Yes. Uh, by the way, do you recall what the position was being called? Was, was there a title of what the position was that he was uh, said to? I think it was the head of the regional. Oh, just head yes. of the yes. yes, okay. Now, when you speak as you have done, explaining the structure, of the bank and the, who sits where. You, you're doing so now from certainly your knowledge as somebody from within yes. the bank, is that Correct. right? You, you know the, that those are Correct. the structures and so on and so on. And, and you are familiar with the, with the regulations, with whatever instruments must be followed in Correct. the filling of, of positions, including su such a, a position. So, so you are saying that uh, uh, the relevant instruments governing the appointment of personnel, uh, including somebody who would occupy that position of head of the regional bank, uh, did not permit that uh, a shareholder could uh, say, here is somebody who must be appointed without, uh, and the bank agreeing to do that without being in breach of its own regulations or instruments. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So, <coughs> so, with your knowledge of the instruments that um, uh, govern appointments in the bank, Are you able to make sense of the announcement at the time that Minister Nene uh, was uh, not going to continue as Minister of Finance because he was going to be deployed in that position? Uh, or is it something that you are not able to understand how it would happen? Yeah, it, it didn't make sense to me, in my experience now, no longer as intelligence, but as a banker. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me at all that that, that would, could firstly happen. But secondly, it didn't make sense to me that Minister uh, Nene would accept that. Because he served as the, the, on the, as a governor. On a higher position. On the higher position. Mm -hmm. And now he was going to be taking a considerably lower position 
Mm. Uh, and that wouldn't, made, wouldn't have made sense to me if I was in that position. Um, mm. And I, I didn't see how Minister Nene would have taken up that position in any event. Well, he says in his statement, which he submitted to the Commission, I think also in his evidence, he makes the same point that he was already serving in a higher position. That's correct. And um, this, would, this was a lower position. But if I recall correctly, either at the time of that announcement or subsequently when the former president was answering questions in the National Assembly on the decision, um, I seem to recall that the idea as he articulated it was we need in that bank uh, or in that position we need somebody, one of our own, and we need a good performer, and uh, that's why we are sending him there. Mm. Um, so, so you say, but in terms of the instruments of the bank, you can't see how it would happen quite apart from yep. the fact that it was a lower position for him. That is my evidence, sir. Mm. And, and just by the way, uh, we have... South Africa has the position for now uh, of the chief financial officer of the new development bank, uh, who is also, I think, considered as a vice president of the bank, uh, who was nominated by Minister Nene. His name is Mr. Leslie Marsdop. And it's when in the formation of the bank, uh, Mr. Marsdorp was uh, appointed to that position through the proper processes and so forth. So it would have been incredibly odd for Minister Nene, who in his capacity appointed uh, through the regular process and appropriate process uh, a individual to the chief financial officer post, then only to eventually report much lower down the line to that office. Uh, it just didn't make sense. It didn't make sense at all. You, you may not be able to answer this, and uh, I would understand. Do you, would you know whether the shareholders would appreciate or would have knowledge and appreciation of all of these things? Or is it possible that some of the shareholders thought you could just say, here is our nominee, and uh, then the nominee would be appointed. On a generous interpretation, I have to conclude that uh, our shareholders, in particular, did not have a thorough understanding of how this bank would work, how it would be set up, what are the instruments, uh, and how do you ensure that in the banking environment that the separation between policy and uh, management and implementation, especially uh, because these banks get international ratings and the ratings determine the, the kind of the cost of money that you would be able to raise. Uh, and if there's interference in, in, in the banking, in governance issues, it affects the ratings very badly. The, so I think on the gender uh, side of the interpretation, I think our shareholders did not have a proper and due uh, understanding of how the mechanism of the bank would actually work. Yeah, when you say our shareholders, you mean our as South Africa's? South Africa, yes. Yes. Now, at the time when Mr. Nene was uh, dropped from cabinet, which was 9 December 2015, were you already in the bank, working in the bank? Uh, in the, the year was 2015. Yes, I was already. I was in the bank. Uh, I was in the DBSA from 2012, yes. August 2012. Yes, okay, thank you. You were going to deal, Mr. Sheikh, <coughs> with the issue of disinformation. Yes. Um, and the use of disinformation uh, by possible use of disinformation by intelligence agencies? The, 
very briefly said that we, our country does have a history of um, what is called disinformation. And disinformation is the manufacturing of false intelligence for purposes of influencing the target. The, and, and the country has a long history of this starting from the days of, of President Nelson Mandela all the way to uh, President Zuma and I'm sure even now President uh, Ramaphosa may uh, be the target of such disinformation campaigns and they take they take a, a very unique form uh, where you put pieces of information together that may appear to be true but when you really go into the detail you'll find that this is not the case and these disinformation campaigns you'll recall uh, way back in 1994 uh, the head of the then uh, SANDF General Mayring uh, presented a report to Nelson Mandela in which uh, to President Nelson Mandela in which it was alleged that uh, there was a possible coup been planned against President Mandela that involved, amongst others, some South African names, and including the name of Michael Jackson. Uh, and this report, and I, I would understand that, that General Mayring uh, may not know what to have done with it, so he did the pass it on to, to President uh, Mandela, who rejected the report. But like that report, we have had many other reports. They're called Browse Mole. They call spider web, they are called the whole range of things where these reports emanate from, from sources that you quite can't locate uh, and uh, brought together. And the first telltale sign of that is, uh, and just an example for you, if someone calls you and says, I cannot discuss this over the phone with you, uh, I need to meet you in person. Uh, just let an alarm bell ring in your head. I mean, uh, if the person can't discuss it over the phone with you, he will not be able to discuss it in person with you as well. Uh, so, the, we were deeply concerned by this phenomenon, deeply concerned. So, again, under the leadership of Ambassador Matatuka in, in 2010, we uh, invited a, a specialist in this matter, and it happened to be a Ghanaian by the name of Kofi Bentham Quanston. Uh, he's an ex... Uh, uh, it might be helpful if you are able to spell that for the transcribers, okay. if you are able to... Kofi, K-O-F-I, Bentham, B-E-N-T-U-M, Quanston, Q-U-A-N-S-T-O-N. Thank so, you. So Kofi is a specialist on the matter and he's written books uh, because his country too was affected by, by this phenomenon of bogus informants, bogus reports, etc. So we uh, invited him over uh, and had a all-day seminar on on our facilities where we tried to grapple with this phenomenon of uh, disinformation and how to, to be able to, to manage disinformation uh, and to neutralize its very destructive effects. Uh, but often, and it is something that I will spend my days really reflecting on, is what is it in our society that we lend ready ears to conspiracies, etc. Uh, and, and it just seems that we do have a society in which we reject modernity, uh, where we do not embrace the proper science of like, is this possibly true or not true, and subject it to the rigors of analysis and come to the conclusion that this is not true and therefore reject it and don't act on it. And therefore, thereby minimizing its destructive effects. I have found that there is, and this goes across administrations, that there has been a tendency to lend a ready ear to these disinformation campaigns 
and it has been a, uh, a source of destabilization of our government through various epochs. So again, many of the examples, browse mall, spider web, uh, I just forget all the names now, and they all come up with very interesting names. Uh, just, uh, you know, it's just, it, that happens when you do not rely on your intelligence services as your fact-checking entity. If you have an intelligence service, equip it, guide it, allow it to go through all the information and be able to tell you that this is not true, this is maybe reasonably true and rejected. But, and you'll also notice that these reports emanate from out of the blue. They, they just find their way in and uh, make themselves, they appear in the media and go forward. Now, on the matter of disinformation, sir, I must also put on record that it is said, suggested, and it has been suggested in, as a result of uh, an allegation I made in respect of the previous uh, National Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, in which and as a result of the allegations I made, uh, people have, have accused me of being a, a disinformation specialist, etc. So I want to put on record that uh, that is not the case. The allegation which was dealt with in the Heifer Commission was not a whispering campaign I started or a... Is this a reference to the first National Director of Public Prosecutions? It is correct, sir. Yes, okay. All right. And I went through that process. I openly said what I had to say. Uh, I did not write funny reports, etc. Openly said the, the Judge Heffer dealt with the matter. He rejected the allegations that I made. And I accepted the outcome of that uh, report. And I uh, accordingly went to apologize to, to uh, uh, the first Bulani uh, Nuka yes. and his wife, mm. uh, and I think the matter between us is is settled, uh, because what I believed I did at the time, I would rather classify it as whistleblowing. Uh, I knew of certain information, and I was with the view that the office of the National Director of Public Prosecution was being used for political purposes uh, and that in my mind represented an abuse of state uh, power. But the media had a field day. Uh, it is, if you want to Google it, I'm still trying to get it removed from Google. It is all there and I've learned with, with the passage of time the wisdom and the resilience to, to bear that uh, and accept that it is a cross that I, I would have to bear but I am not involved in the game of disinformation, and I am not, and I never was, part of dirty tricks, uh, so to speak. That uh, allegation to which you've referred is reported in the publication by Jacques Poe, The President's Keepers. You're aware yes. of that? I'm aware of this. But I must say that I have a lot of respect for, for Jacques, and I think in, in the way he wrote what he wrote there, he was taking what we call uh, uh, liberties, so to speak. But there are elements in what he wrote there, it's true, that I did in fact, uh, I did in fact have a meeting with Arthur Fraser at the time, and I did in fact mention to Arthur Fraser that I heard that he has these so-called tapes. And here's the important thing, that I asked him to do the right thing. And he asked me what is the right thing and I said, you have information in your possession that affects the innocence or otherwise of another person. Take this information to the National Prosecuting Authority. And he did. He did. He didn't take it anywhere else. He took it to the National Prosecuting Authority and that is what Jacques Paul refers to and I accept that that is correct. If I may just put uh, a brief excerpt from the book to you so that the air can be properly cleared and the matter yes. is uh, thoroughly dealt with. 
he says at page 39 of his publication, Mo Sheikh was involved in the Zuma camp's own dirty tricks campaign two weeks after the state had announced that the NPA was about to hurl Shabir Sheikh before a judge, Mo Sheikh identified prosecution's boss Bulalani, Bulalani and Kuka as apartheid spy RS-452. He later said he'd made the allegations in order to defend the honor of the deputy president of this country, Jacob Zuma. Do you have any comment on that? Well, the A, the, in my capacity as an intelligence officer way back in the 1980s, I had come across information that gave me reason to investigate Bulalani Nuka uh, for possible association with the apartheid government. Uh, that was communicated to head office uh, and communicated to, to Lusaka. And the matter for me rested there until much later when I received other information. And then in light of, in light of the abuses that were taking place or the uh, abuse of office in, of, of the deputy president, uh, not necessarily Shabir, but the Deputy President in particular, Mac Maharaj II, I was of the view that, uh, that there may be a link between the investigation that we did way back in the 1980s to what is happening now. And I went public with that. Uh, and then as a result, the Heifer Commission uh, resulted. Uh, I didn't consider that to be dirty tricks. Uh, I didn't consider that to be part of a smear campaign. Uh, it was very public, very open uh, commission, and I willingly participated in it, uh, subjected myself to the interrogation, made it clear that I would accept the outcome of the, the, the judge's report, and which I did. So I didn't, I didn't see that as, as dirty tricks. However, I must say that I know Jacques, uh, and when I read that, I smiled and, and said this is the liberty he's taking as, as a novelist or a journalist, and I'm not going to make an issue of it. Um, the agent uh, codenamed RS-452 was apparently later identified as a Vanessa Breton. Is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. We may move on then, um, just to close off on the memorandum uh, that we have spoken about. Uh, just for completeness sake in that regard, you were part of a delegation of signatories to that memorandum to the office of the Secretary General of the ANC, Mr. Mantaj. That's correct. How were you received? We were received very well, uh, very well. The I, I couldn't remember all the names of the officials that were there, but uh, it was. Uh, but we were received very well by the Secretary General, by Jesse Duarte, and I think Jeff Khadebe was also there. Uh, so it was a, a, a good delegation. In relation to intelligence documentation um, and access to intelligence documentation in relation to the issue of state capture, raised in that memorandum. Did you make any suggestions to the um, ruling party at the time? Yes. Uh, we, we suggested that the office of the Inspector General be approached in which, and knowing the, the, the laws and the regulations that govern the Inspector General, that the political party could have uh, approached the Inspector General for access to documentation or information uh, as may be classified or declassified by the Inspector General's office himself. Uh, I was not willing, and I know that Ambassador Makatuka was not willing, to provide that documentation to the ANC because then it would have been in violation of the very Constitution that we are furthering the aims of a political party and we did not want to get involved in that. So we raised the issue and show them the mechanism by which they could obtain the information. 
you have mentioned um, in paragraph 48 um, of your statement affidavit a disclosure that you thought prudent yes. to bring to the attention of the chair would you do so please chair the, since leaving uh, since leaving taking early retirement from the development bank uh, my wife and I have opened an, our own consultancy and we in fact do uh, provide and I in particular do provide services to one organization that may be impl or is implicated in the terms of your reference and I thought it prudent that I disclose that conflict to the extent that it is a conflict although the matters are very separate uh, and I have provided the name of that company to the evidence leader uh, and my preference would be that that matter be discussed in chamber. It's, it's not a conflict. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, one thank last you. topic, please. Uh, the former president has given evidence uh, in relation to intelligence matters uh, before the commission. Um, and this matter has been raised with you, been able to assist uh, in some regard to understand that evidence. Firstly, you have said you had a relationship with the former president in the context of intelligence or security matters. That is correct. Did he ever mention to you um, any conspiracy or plan on the behalf on the part of foreign intelligence agencies in round about 1991 and I recall after he no longer occupied the position of head of intelligence in uh, the ANC uh, he did mention to me that uh, he had been given information that there are two foreign uh, agencies who want to stop him from assuming power uh, in, in, in the country. I assumed at that point in time that what he was referring to because in 1994 power was a bit vague in terms of what particular power we're talking about and I thought that he was referring to perhaps they don't want him to be the head of the intelligence services or rise within the political ranks, assuming ministerial post, etc. But he did mention that to me, but he did not, uh, he did not give me the details of exactly that conversation, who said this to him, etc. But he mentioned it to me, and, uh, and I, on the other hand, did not push to ask where is it coming from, etc. It is something that you don't do in, in the intelligence game. The information that was given to you, uh, was it that he should not be head of an intelligence agency or was it that there was a conspiracy that he should be prevented from assuming power in any capacity whatsoever? I, I saw all of that in one, one package. Uh, the, but if I, I would when I really think about it now, I would assume that he was referring to political power in, in government, so to speak. Would and maybe within the ANC as well. Why? I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. I'm sorry. Maybe within the ANC yes, as a well, political may, party itself as yes, well. Yes, it may be within the ANC as a, the, the political party as well. Yes, because the, could, could, the two could go together Hand in the higher you rise in the political party, the ruling party, the higher you may rise in terms of government positions. That's correct. Mm. Okay. Right. What interest would a foreign intelligence agency have in, let's just deal with the one aspect, which I understood uh, to be what you told us, um, the interest in someone not assuming an intelligence position, uh, someone of the background of the former president? 
Well, the, the <coughs> possible reasons for that is we did, we did, and remember the world at that time was just emerging out of essentially the Cold War era in which uh, intelligence services were the front line of the war that existed between the various intelligence services. Uh, and it is a possibility that these intelligence services may not want someone who has been trained in the East or trained in, in by either the East Germans or the, the Russians to be the head of the intelligence service here on the basis that once in, in, in position of power, they, the natural leaning would be towards the services from which they were trained. Uh, and I think the possibilities that the Western intelligence services were trying to avoid that, which is more a reflection on the thinking of Western intelligence services. Apart from what you were told by the former president, um, do you have any of your own knowledge in this regard? This, I don't want to cross the line into intelligence matters unnecessarily. Well, I do know that uh, there is various training that does occur by intelligence services across the world of each other. And those relationships uh, do, in fact, carry a degree of, uh, of persuasion, but not necessarily to the extent they think it does. Uh, but we, we as a country, has benefited from that uh, because previous apartheid intelligence services were trained by Mossad and others. Uh, so. Western intelligence services in the main. The liberatory forces were trained by the Eastern intelligence services in the main. And when we all came together, we had the benefit of, of all of that training. So yes, uh, it is training does have a level of influence on trainees subsequently. At the time this conversation between yourself and the former president took place, or indeed at any other time, did the former president tell you that the reason um, that uh, he, the former president, should not uh, rise either in the intelligence or in the governing party ranks was that he would somehow be able to reveal, no reveal and block assumption of power by infiltrators? No, we didn't, uh, we didn't have uh, that uh, kind of discussion. But I must say that in the in discussions on intelligence, often those things are assumed and, and applied, but we didn't have a direct discussion on it. Well, given your knowledge of the intelligence structures at the time and your participation in those intelligence structures, and given your knowledge of the position held by yourself and others and the former president would he have had exclusive knowledge of the identity of infiltrators no uh, I think he would have had a uh, privileged access to that knowledge but uh, as a, in his capacity as head of the intelligence service he would not have the only access uh, there were others like uh, Sizakela Sagash Joe and Klantler, uh, who, and of course, yourself, uh, to the extent I would, would have from the, from the parts that I worked with, others who worked with it would have that knowledge. Uh, so the knowledge would not be the purview of one person, so to speak. Uh, and of course, the, the intelligence services did not, the ANC intelligence service did not exist in isolation from the leadership of ANC itself. And they were reporting lines to the leadership, and I think the leadership uh, would also have been taken into confidence about suspicions or whatever. The former president also alluded to the fact that 
this plot or conspiracy continued to the very present. present. Um, do you have any comment in that regard? And in fact, he went so far as to say that this commission itself uh, was the culmination of such a conspiracy. Do you have any comment on the continuing nature of this conspiracy? I have uh, no knowledge of a, a of a conspiracy to have toppled the previous president. Uh, there was not that I was aware of, uh, and the if if anything, if our memorandum, which was I think the first that called for a commission, was a desperate plea to the president to hear the cries of South Africans who are saying all is not well in this land. And that is not a conspiracy. That was simply a plea for him uh, to listen to rational voices talking about things that are not going right in the country. And it's unfortunate that he would have considered that to be a, a conspiracy. Thank you, Mr. Sheikh. Thank you. Chair, I have no further questions. No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sheikh, for your evidence. Uh, we have taken much longer than we may all have thought we would, but I think it was all very important. Um, the evidence touched on very important issues which the Commission uh, wanted to hear evidence on. Thank you very much for coming forward. And uh, I just hope that your coming forward and uh, the fact that your colleagues, two other colleagues are also, uh, have made themselves available will encourage a lot of other former and current deputy DGs and deputy DGs uh, nationally and in various provinces who know a lot of things that should be shared with the Commission in order to enable the Commission to have a full picture of what the situation is in our country that it has gone through and to enable the Commission to make recommendations that hopefully can uh, help to make sure that uh, the future of the country is better than the past. So I hope that your having come to the Commission uh, will assist and encourage and inspire others. But thank you very much for coming forward. And uh, if uh, a need arises that we ask you to come back, I have no doubt that you will uh, be agreeable to coming back. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And you are excused. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is uh, Mr. Njenje. Yes. Um, I see we would need five or so minutes to, to, start to facilitate the turnover, yes. but um, I wonder whether an early break would um, help so that we don't break twice. We could take the lunch break now and then maybe uh, resume at a quarter to two. Um, that would avoid two breaks. Break once. <laughs> yes. Um, but of course, if we took just five minutes, if that's all you would need, we could cover the preliminary issues before one o'clock and when we come back at two o'clock, maybe we are going to the meat of the evidence, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so your preferences would be that we take the break now. It's just that if we keep to the one o'clock, two o'clock, uh, arrangement for lunch, it, it might help with certain things and so happy on. that we take five minutes. Five minutes and, and then we'll you, you use the 15 minutes before one o'clock to take care of preliminary issues or
whatever introductory parts and then when you come back at two o'clock we go into the real issues yes thank you okay we'll take this 22 we'll resume at five at quarter to one thank we you. adjourn all rise
She ate it. As I have expressed to Mr. Sheikh, apply to you. And we appreciate that people who occupied senior positions in various government departments who have got something to share with the Commission and with the nation in an attempt to assist the Commission, to assist the nation, come forward and share that information with, with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Pretorius. <coughs> Director Njenji, you have uh, before you Exhibit PP2. That is correct. Perhaps we should admit that then. We already did for all of them, including okay. uh, the next witness yesterday. Well, I don't, I don't know, Director Njenji, I don't know where I got the general part from. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. You signed your uh, statement. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Pretorius. It, it's, it's, it's hot. I feel hot. Maybe the air con a little bit. I know that I keep on confusing you. Sometimes I say switch it off. Sometimes I say put it on. But maybe it shouldn't be too much because sometimes it affects the hearing. Uh, but Mr. Pretorius looks at me as if he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's not feeling hot. No, I'm not. <laughs> so m maybe it's, it's just me. But, uh, Chair, uh, I take no responsibility for <laughs> the air conditioning. Um, I'm prepared to assist. <laughs> okay, all right, let's continue. Uh, Mr. Ngenji, it appears from page 8 of Exhibit PP2 that you signed a statement on the 26th of November 2018. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, did you then attest to the statement before a commission of oaths? That is correct. Was that on the 20th of August 2019? That is correct. The well, it's... Uh this may have nothing to do with you. It's, uh, it's rather unusual in the sense that uh, it doesn't have what we call the Commission of Oath Certificate at the end, uh, or at least I don't see it. I don't know whether the fine print on the stamp it is a reads like a certificate of the Commission of Votes, but also because at the beginning, I don't think it does what normally an affidavit does, namely, I do hereby swear or make an oath in sense. Yes, it and doesn't. So, the introduction doesn't do that, and we can fix it up. But yeah. the fine print of the stamp mm. uh, on page eight yes. does contain the requisite. Uh, wedding. Wedding for for, for the wedding. certificate. Yes. Okay. Okay. <coughs> uh, Mr. Njenje, or Director Njenje, uh, tell the court, please, uh, as you do in paragraph two and three of of your statement or affidavit of your background. Can you repeat, please? In paragraph two and three yeah. of your statement, I'll refer to it for the moment as a statement, you record some of your own personal background. Would you tell that to the court, to uh, the commissioner, please? I uh, left the country in 1977 and I uh, joined the ANC. I uh, joined the military wing of Mkonto Wisizwe, and I went a uh, military training. And a, uh, a few years later, I went to specialize in intelligence uh, in, in, uh, in, in Russia, or Soviet Union at the time. And a, uh, after completed training, I returned uh, to Africa and uh, applied uh, the intelligence trade for 
Emilie for Mkonto Wesizu in the Department of uh, Intelligence and Security of the ANC. Did I, you do so from 1979 until 1994? That is correct. What was your role in the Department of Intelligence and Security of the I played, then ANC party? I, pl I played various uh, uh, roles uh, and responsibilities uh, in, the, uh, in the Department of Intelligence and Security. Uh, yeah, starting off with uh, the vetting of people who were coming through Mozambique uh, in joining the ANC. And those would be a, a cadres of the ANC who, whether they were going to join Mkonto Wesizwe or were going to school, they had to go through the processes of vetting, security vetting. And a, I, I did that until 1980, 81, a, where I was then a, a meet the administrator um, for the office in Maputo the, ANC, the uh, DIS office in Maputo. And a, uh, that meant now working on intelligence information, including all the biographies that would have been collected by the field workers where, where I had been before, and a, uh, receiving reports uh, from Swaziland, from uh, Lesotho, and from South Africa and those would include uh, yeah, very sensitive intelligence reports. In the course those of, those sorry, reports... Oh, I think he is not done. Those reports I would compile uh, and consolidate and uh, send to Lusaka every week. Director Njenji, in the course of your work as an official of the Department of Intelligence Security of the ANC between 1979 and 1994, would you have come to know of threats of infiltration into the ANC? That is correct. Uh, was it part of your duty to know the identity of such persons? That is correct. And from whom would you receive such information and to whom would you give such information? That information would be a uh, 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 from my from where I was sitting at the time. I would I would uh, uh, provide that to the leadership of of the department, who I knew would then pass on uh, to the leadership of the ANC, specifically the president of the ANC. So the information that you say you would receive, you receive weekly from Mozambique would be information about individuals who, who were joining the ANC as well as simply reports about the situation in the country. In other words, just intelligence, intelligence information about maybe certain parts of the country or the country quite apart from intelligence information about individuals. It is correct, Chair. Uh, yeah, it would be information that we would have uh, received from the interviews that were conducted on individuals who are joining. It would be information that we would have received from open source the newspapers, the media. It would be information that would be received from agents of the, of, of, of the department and the ANC, as well as a uh, membership or underground people who were working for the ANC providing information as well as information that would be coming from a year within the, uh, the former enemy ranks, people who would be working for the, for, for the ANC and the Department of Intelligence Security. Yeah, but what I want to establish is whether you were focusing or specializing on intelligence information relating to people who were joining the ANC. In other words, focusing on people as such, get, getting information about those people, or whether it was also getting intelligence information generally about the country or certain parts of the country, apart from the individuals who are joining. It is both the people as well as general information and across the country. Okay.
Thank you. Is that a convenient time? Uh, yes, let's take the lunch adjournment and we'll resume at 2 o'clock. Thank you. We adjourn. All rise.